lyricism was once the root of this hip hop thing. A lot of things didn't change, got heavy on the beats, but the cat we're talking about today takes lyricism to a whole nother level. This right here is episode one, season two, so you know we gotta start it off with a bang. Let's get into it. It's so yeah, D. Alone, I was never on my own. Yeah, D. Had hip hop got me alone. Yeah, D. Make history, put it in a song. Yeah, D. And it's so yeah, D. It's so yeah, D. Alone, I was never on my own. Yeah, D. Had hip hop got me alone. Yeah, D. Make history, put it in a song. Yeah, D. And it's so yeah, D. It's so yeah, D. You dick. What up, world? It's your man, Art, back with another episode of your dig. And this right here is episode one of season two. So, you know, we had to hit you again in the head with that new hip-hop flavor. <laughs> we back at you, man. So glad to be here. So, you know, with episode one, got to hit you hard, man. This is going to be the Black Power Movement episode. Going to get into the Black Power Movement's influence on hip-hop. Then we're going to jump over to a Black Power Movement artist, your boy Nas. Yes, sir, Nasir Jones. Then we're going to run that back on a powerful album that came out recently. That soundtrack to that Judas and the Black Messiah crazy soundtrack man so you know we got to touch on that but this is episode one season two so we're gonna hit you in the head right off man let's go ahead and knock you out right now you dig (laughs) if you know the origins of hip-hop do you know that hip-hop was born out of the struggle Specifically, black people struggle in the inner cities of America. It's without a doubt that hip-hop did its part in addressing these issues, but before hip-hop, there was the black power movement. Today in this segment of Let's Rap, we're going to examine the influence of the black power movement on hip-hop. The black power movement is classified online as a social movement for the safety and self-sufficiency of black people, originated in the 1960s and declined in the late 70s and 80s. The term Black Power was first publicized in Richard Wright's 1954 novel, Black Power. It was first popularized by Stokely Carmichael, also known as Kwame Torre, who was one of the leaders of a civil rights group, SNCC. In Mississippi, June 1966, during the March Against Fear, Kwame led marches in a chant of Black Power that was nationally televised. So let's take it back a little, though, because Black Power movements go as far back as the uprisings during American chattel slavery. Other black power movements that predate 1960 include the UNIA, led by the Honorable Marcus Garvey. It should also be noted that Malcolm X's father was an organizer for the UNIA until he was murdered by the Klan in 1931. Also, the Nation of Islam, which started in 1930, and even before that, the Moorish Science Temple in 1913. All of these movements played an integral part in the world's progression, but by the mid-1960s, the energy within the black power movement changed. The primary catalyst for this change was the assassination of Malcolm X. Malcolm's death helped birth the Black Panthers. Then in 1968, Dr. King's assassination took the energy of Malcolm's death to a whole nother level. There were uprises nationwide, but one of the biggest energy shifts took place in the music. So finally, back to the music. In the wake of Dr. King's death, hip-hop's OG godfather, James Brown, released the classic single, Say It Loud, I'm Black and I'm Proud. In August 1968, this became the official anthem of the Black Power movement. While the Panthers were in the streets harnessing the energy of Black Power, the music waves were also reflecting the minds of the people. Songs like Marvin Gaye's What's Going On in 1971 and Curtis Mayfield's Move On Up in 1970 were addressing the struggles of Black America like popular music had never done before. So, where does hip-hop come into play? First off, hip-hop's OG godfather is James Brown, also the most sampled artist in hip-hop history. James Brown embodied black power like no other. Next is the Black Panthers and the energy they set forth, spawning groups like Public Enemy and N.W.A. Many people don't know LL Cool J's roots with the black power teachings of the 5% Nation, but hip-hop pillars Rakim and Big Daddy Kane presented 5% knowledge heavy throughout their careers. Honestly, the 5% Nation has been somewhat of a bridge between contemporary black power movements and hip-hop. If you're not too familiar with the 5% Nation, we did a whole breakdown of them in Season 1 of Your Dig, Episode 11. Heavy information on that one. 
In addition to the acts I just named, artists such as Nas, Wu-Tang, Poor Righteous Teachers, Brand Nubian, and many more were all pushing 5%. Artists like Queen Latifah, A Tribe Called Quest and the Native Tongues, Arrested Development, they were all taking the Black Power movement to another level by embracing their African heritage and implanting it in hip-hop culture. Now you see artists with A Tribe Called Quest vibe, that energy came from the Black Power movement. Tupac Shakur, one of hip-hop's most influential artists ever, was the son of a prominent panther, Afeni Shakur. While some may beg to differ, I see the energy of the Black Power movement in a lot of these current or recent artists, and not just the ones you might deem conscious. I want to give a quick shout and all rap to our brother Nipsey Hussle, cats like Denzel Curry and Danielle Farrar, even violent artists like King Vaughn, if you listen closely, R.I.P. to bro. So I think it's clear to see the direct impact that the Black Power movement has had on hip-hop, but right now, I want to throw on my conspiracy theory hat and talk about an impact that the Black Power movement had that we don't typically talk about. That is the impact of the Black Power Counterintelligence Program, i.e. Pro. In my opinion, Pro began their assault on hip-hop with the attempted effeminization of black men in mid-80s hip-hop. Just my opinion, though. Then, the negative impact of certain acts' early use of the N-word and B-word, also some of the ruthless violence expressed by these same groups, makes me wonder if they were Quantel Pro. Many artists of the last couple of decades definitely feel like Quantel Pro, whether they know it or not. Either way, the Black Power movement sparked all of this. Hands down, one of the best of all time. If he's not in your top five, he's in almost everybody's top 10. His tenacity and versatility earned him the rap name Nasty. Today, we're talking about the prodigy turned legend, all-time great MC, Nas. Nas was born Nasir Ben Oludora Jones in Brooklyn, New York, to Oludora and Ann Jones. Oludora, born Charles Jones, is a well-known jazz trumpeter originally from Natchez, Mississippi, and Ann Jones was from North Carolina. He also has a brother named Jabari, a.k.a. Jungle, who has been Nas's right-hand man since forever. Nas and his family relocated to Queensbridge when he was young. Both of his parents were heavily influenced by the Black Power movement, with Nas mentioning his mother being civilized by the Universal Team, aka the 5% Nation, on the track Papa Was a Player off that Lost Tapes. Olu Dura's career as a jazz musician was extremely impactful in Nas's desire to become an entertainer. Although Nas did follow in his father's footsteps for a while playing the trumpet, hip-hop had a hold on Nas the whole time. Nas started out doing graffiti and dancing, but said they got played out. The rapping part never left, though. Nas started writing rhymes at a very, very young age. He enlisted his neighbor and best friend, Ill Will, to be his DJ. Nas's first rap name was Kid Wave. Then he adopted Nasty Nas, settling on Nas, of course. He dropped out in the eighth grade shortly after his parents' divorce. During this time, Nas began studying 5% teachings and the teachers of Dr. York. Though he came out in the 90s, Nas was on the hip-hop scene early. In the late 1980s, legendary producer Large Professor took Nas to sit in on Eric B. and Rakim's studio sessions. Nas said he would hop on the mic whenever Rakim took breaks. He made his solo debut under the name Nasty Nas with the song Halftime appearing on the Zebrahead soundtrack. His best friend and former DJ Ill Will was murdered in 1992. This murder pushed Nas to go even harder early in his career. In 1994, at just 20 years old, Nas released one of the most iconic projects in hip-hop history. His debut album, Illmatic, is widely regarded as Nas' best album, and many hip-hop heads list this as their favorite album of all time. Illmatic is actually a dedication to Nas' homeboy Illmatic Ice, who was locked up for murder around the time Nas was making this album. The album is a 10-track classic with zero logical skips, the whole album is a standout, but some of the standout tracks are The World Is Yours, Life's A B featuring AZ, and the outro, It Ain't Hard To Tell. Crazy, crazy outro, man. This album received an overwhelmingly positive response from the media, so you know when he dropped that sophomore album it was written, it debuted at number one. It Was Written was a very street album. The album was slightly darker than his debut, spawning hits such as The Message, Street Dreams, and one of the best hip-hop collabs of all time, If I Ruled the World featuring Lauryn Hill. By this time, Nas was a household name in hip-hop. 
His first two albums went double platinum. Then in 1997, he released an album with the hip-hop supergroup, The Firm. The Firm was a group consisting of Nas and rappers AZ, Foxy Brown, and Nature. Their one album entitled The Album was the second album ever released by Aftermath Interscope. This album featured songs such as Dr. Dre Produced Phone Tap and the single Firm Biz. A year after the release of the Firm album, Nas made his film debut starring as Sincere in the cult classic hip-hop film Belly. This movie was directed by legendary music video guru Hype Williams and co-stars our guy DMX. While Nas did perform well in the movie in my opinion, this would be Nas' only star role in the movie and one of a few movie screen appearances. It should be noted that Nas was in the movie In Too Deep in 1999, though he wasn't credited. Then in 2013, he did have a significant role in the movie Black Nativity. As for music, Nas returned after a three-year solo hiatus with one of my favorite albums of all time, I Am. The album featured classic hits like Hate Me Now and Nas Is Like, in addition to numerous other fire tracks and dope features. Later that same year in 1999, Nas released another album entitled Nostradamus. Nas's next album was released late 2001 amidst beef with hip-hop pillar Jay-Z. On Jay-Z's album The Blueprint, released three months prior to Nas's album, Jay-Z verbally assaulted Nas on the track The Takeover. When Nas released this album entitled Stillmatic, it possessed one of the illest diss songs in hip-hop history, a song called Ether. The song was so impactful that Ether became a synonym for getting this. Nas had cats out here getting Ether. Stillmatic is probably my favorite Nas album with hits such as Got Yourself a Gun, the classic track One Mike, and numerous album hits. Nas's next project, God's Son, was released in 2002 following the death of his mother earlier that year. The album was heavily produced by Salam Remy and featured elite singles Get Down, Made You Look, and the classic motivation song I Can. All of these songs were produced by Salam Remy. In 2004, Nas released his first and only double album entitled Streets Disciple. This album contains songs like Bridging the Gap featuring Nas's father, Lil Durant, and the super hard track Thief's Theme, both tracks produced by Salam Remy. In 2006, Nas gave us one of my favorite Nas albums entitled Hip Hop Is Dead. This album barely produced any singles, but go check for the tracks Black Republican featuring Jay-Z, not Going Back featuring Nas's then-wife, Khalees, and Blunt Ashes, produced by NBA star Chris Webber. I banged this joint the whole summer 07. One of the most prolific artists of all time, Nas hit us with more heat in 2008 with the Untitled album, originally titled The N-Word. This is another one of my favorite Nas albums. No singles, but the album is crazy. The highlights include tracks America, also, N-I-G-G-E-R, The Slave and the Master, and You Can't Stop Us Now, produced by Salam Remy. In 2010, sticking to his pattern of every two years, Nas released the collaboration album Distant Relatives with legendary reggae artist Damian Marley. Two artists from completely different genres meshed effortlessly. Go on that album from top to bottom, only a couple skips. Also, Nas donates all of his royalties from this project to charities for Africa. Bruh. I almost left out Lost Tapes. Lost Tapes dropped 2002, couple months before Godson, full of hits, man. That's one of my favorite projects. Still go back and listen to that this day, like all the time. Nas catalog is crazy. With 15 plus albums under his belt, releasing strong albums just as recently as King's Disease in summer 2020, man. I mean, come on. For the sake of this being the Nas episode, I think it's only right that we give you our top 10 Nas albums. It was crazy hard to do this, man, but we did it, so let's get into it. Number one, Stillmatic. It was hard to put this over Illmatic, but Nas was just a little more mature at this point, and he had a lot more to talk about. Number two, Illmatic. One of the best exhibitions hip-hop has ever seen, hip-hop pillar for short. Number three, I Am. Singles plus album hits. We spent so much time with this album growing up, boy. Number four, It Was Written. Great collection of songs, great beats, concepts, great, great features, great album, man. Number five, The Lost Tapes, one of my favorite Nas albums. This is the album that was flush with hits, highly slept on in my opinion. Number five, The Lost Tapes, one of my favorite Nas albums. This album was flush with hits, highly slept on in my opinion. I mean, I almost slept on it. Number six, The Untitled Album. This is Nas' most hard-hitting album from a social commentary standpoint. The songs evoke incredible energy. Number seven, 
distant relatives. Seamless merging of two genres, two artists on the same page for the same cause. <laughs> Put together something awesome, man. Number eight, Godson. It's a great combination of commercial appeal and important content. Number nine, Life is Good. This felt like a nice celebration album. Opens up super strong and there are plenty dope tracks on this one. Number 10, Hip Hop is Dead. Fly messaging and creativity on this one. Numerous sleeper hits on this album. So the honorable mention Nas albums we're going to go with, got to get into that Nostradamus, Streets Disciple, and King's Disease, that last joint. So big shouts out to the homie Nas, hands down one of the best to ever do it. Nas' art embodies hip hop to the fullest, man. Super duper album maker, lyrical genius. Thank you for paving the way for real rap. Project. It's actually the first soundtrack we've reviewed here, you did, for that movie, Judas and the Black Messiah. So Fred Hampton is actually one of my heroes, and I'll be honest and say, I have not seen this movie, but I have listened to the soundtrack like two or three times. The soundtrack is executive produced by Hit Boy, but there are numerous producers on this, and the album is actually 22 tracks deep, so you know we're not going to get as deep as we normally get, but we are going to give you those highlights, so let's go ahead and get to them. So from the top of the album, it hits you hard with a spoken word piece performed by the great Fred Hampton's son, Fred Hampton Jr. This is a heavy piece and an awesome way to open the album. Track three is a Nas and Hit Boy song entitled EPMD. The song isn't that crazy, but it's Nas and Hit Boy, so you definitely need to hear it. Track four is a highlight joint called Welcome to America from the OG Black Thought. Thought killed this joint, but I really wasn't feeling the hook. Too country songish for me. Track 5 is one of the best joints on the project. Joint entitled What It Feels Like featuring two of my top 10, Jay-Z and Nip. This song is immediately a classic from the performers, but Jay's verse certified the classic label. Bro went too hard, bro. Hit Boy performed and produced track 6 entitled Broad Day. This song is hot and it's so dope to hear someone on the level of hit spitting for the people like this. Fly track for sure. The next highlight comes in track 8, Something Ain't Right. Featuring Masego, J.I.D., and Rhapsody. All of these artists went in, and especially Masego's vocal performance at the end, killed it. Track 11, Appraised, is probably the best song on the project. And it comes from an artist I had never heard of. Dude named White Dave. It's actually, I think it's Ryan Coogler's brother. Ryan Coogler, the director of Black Panther, and also producer of this movie. I think he put his brother in this joint, but he laid down a praise and that joint is fire. Granted, the song is produced by Hit Boy, so you know it was going to be hot regardless, but this joint right here, gotta hear that, man. A praise by White Dave. Track 12, All Black, is hot for sure. Performed by the homie G Herbo, Chicago represented heavy on this album, man. And Herbo came out spitting for real, like elite. Check this one out ASAP, B. Eh? Track 14, No Profanity, performed by Pooh Shiesty, is a hot joint. Bro laid a dope street track without using profanity. Pretty creative and a dope result. Track 15, Last Man Standing, comes from another Chicago cat and another to be considered for the best song on the project. Polo G been saying something lately and he came super hard for this Fred Hampton album. Track 16, Respect My Mind, is another highlight. A joint performed by Dom Kennedy and Nip's producers Mike and Keys. Dom talking that fly talk, balancing the album. Great stuff for show. Track 17, Revolutionary, performed by Chicago Vets G Herbo and Bump J. Both cats went hard, especially Herbo. Another track you gotta check for. I love hearing brothers provide positive leadership, yo. One of the last tracks on the album, track 20, Rich N Word Problems, is another one of the best songs on the album. Performed by ASAP Rocky. It's the first time we heard from Bro in a while, and he didn't disappoint. The last song on the album is a biography of Fred Hampton entitled Black Messiah. It's performed by the legend Rakim. The song is cool, but it's not what I expected. So breaking down the album overall, gotta give the production four gas masks. I mean, Hit Boy curated these beats, put together a dope album. Also, the messaging, gotta get that four and a half gas mask. I mean, they came really hard in this soundtrack, representing for the brother Fred Hampton. Can't, can't really complain at all about this album. They did their thing as far as the messaging. The lyrics, 
dope, man. Puts together some good artists. I mean, they came hard, gave some of their best work. Presentation, got to give that a four as well. I mean, everybody rapped hard. Everybody gave strong deliveries. It was really no weak artists on this project, man. The overall assessment, I'm going to give this a strong four gas mask. Yeah, man. So this is definitely one of the best soundtracks I've heard in a while, possibly decades. I mean, I'm not really sure what they did with the movie, but they hit it out the park with this soundtrack. Big shouts out to Hit Boy and Ryan Coogler for making this happen. You did? Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. So that's a wrap on another episode of You Dig. That was episode one from season two. Yes, we back at it again. Had to give y'all something real special, man. Broke down the Black Power Movers' influence on hip-hop. Then we gave y'all the hip-hop legacy on one of the greatest to ever do it, that boy Nas. Had to run that back on a fly album, that soundtrack for Judas and the Black Messiah. Very dope album, man. Make sure y'all go listen to that. But you know, we got to end it with you got to hear this. This season, we're doing a little bit different due to copyright issues. We can't actually play the track for you, so I'm going to just give y'all a recommendation. What I'm going to recommend is that Nas song Purple off the Lost Tapes. Crazy trap, melodic Nas killing it like he always do. So the trap Purple off the Lost Tapes, y'all go check for that. But you know, we are going to give y'all something for you got to hear this. With this joint, we're going to give y'all something special. A quick little clip from one of our favorite artists out here. Dude named Lord Ja Monte Ogbon representing Charlotte. Crazy dope artist, man. If y'all ain't heard, cuz, make sure y'all check it after this interview. But we had to give y'all a little quick snippet. Bro talking about the influence of Black Power Movements on his music. So we're going to give y'all that right now. Make sure y'all tag in with everything we doing. You dig the hip-hop show, R&D vlog on YouTube, Rhymes Designs on the internet. You can also find us on the web, that R&D for all the merch. Yes, sir. But yeah, right now, let's get into this quick interview from your boy, Lord Jamate Ogbon. You dig? So I was just trying to find out what else was there, and that's when I found out about the conscious community in Charlotte, and um, met my man Kill Ripken, my man Divine, producers and artists, and there was all, uh, you know what I mean, 5%, excellent guys and earth. I'm just like, they was just, I was just fucked with the, the black man and his God message that they was putting out, and I'm, just, and I'm just like, yo, this is really what it is. Like, I never got 120, mm -hmm. you feel me? So um, it's like, um, I can't remember his dude's name. He been kind of like, um, I had to like just fall back a little, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Because I didn't like officially get to 120, but mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I just really fuck with the, it's so much information out here. It's kind of crazy. That's like another conversation, mm -hmm. but it's so much information out here that it was just, um, I feel like that, but, uh, us as that, you know what I mean? God from within and mm -hmm. black men is God, black women is earth, that right there. Facts. It's kind of, <laughs> that's what I, I would put, you know what I mean? That's so solid. I put a lot of like tr uh, school of thoughts into my music mm -hmm. just cause it's so much information. So like whatever you want to take from it, like, like I said, I studied the Hebrew stuff. Um, if you Christian, if you whatever, you know what I mean? I'll try to give a few different perspectives for people. You know what I mean? Like, just like I, like the conscious community come, you know what I mean? Like the New Wapians, Dr. York stuff. Mm -hmm. I mean, I try to touch on everything, mm -hmm. just so you know. You could be a lot of you know what I mean. Information Bro. you can catch, man, because it's a it lot. Is. It is, a and lot. I'm still like, and I do that because I'm still learning. Cause mm -hmm. I'm like, it's just so much information out here. You never know what is what. So mm -hmm. I'm still learning different stuff. You know what I mean? From different walks of life, and I'm just like, man, it's crazy. Like. So I'm pretty much just pushing the message. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's solid, man. That message is necessary. Uh, actually, just to touch on that a little bit more, um, those were the keys and a lot of my chains as a young black man. You yeah. know what I mean? So knowing that the black man is God, knowing that my queens are the earth that holds mm -hmm. all of this down, yeah. you know what I mean? That was really the keys and a lot of my chains. So I had to ask you that question yeah, to see no, where it came from to you. Yeah, no, that's crazy. Um, it's, it, but it started through just finding out about the Hebrew stuff because I had a homie. He was like, yo, you can rap, but you're not really saying that. And I'm like, what you mean? Like, that's when I started going by the King Callis thing. So I'm like, all right, I'm going to tell you my name, King Callis, because like more of this king, and, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Just giving you the, like, the black perspective, <clears throat> like the chosen people of the Bible stuff. Mm -hmm. So he was telling me about all that, and I'm just like, what? Like, bro, I don't know about none of this. Mm -hmm. Then that's when I found out about all the other stuff, and I'm like. You dick.